Praise the Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm so glad to be back with you all this week for my friends, family, guests, visitors, whatever your status is or your connection is with Bethany Community Church. We're so glad you're here. So now as we begin to go into our praise and worship, I pray that right where you are, you can feel the presence of God and that you would share this with someone else so that they can join us in our corporate worship even now as we do so from our various locations.
before me. Defender behind me. I won't fear. I'm filled with anointing. My cup's overflowing No weapon can harm me I won't fear Mountains and valleys, his joy is refreshing, restores my soul, mercy and Give me assurance that I'll see his glory face to face. Hallelujah.
Hello, welcome to Bethany Community Church. So glad that you could join us this morning. My name is Allie Milner, I'm the Director of Youth Ministry. If it's your first time, go ahead and start a conversation in the chat. We'd love to get to know you a little bit better. Do you have a few announcements for us this morning? Ladies, we have a Bible study coming up. It's going to be a study on the prophet Elijah called Faith and Fire. It's gonna be a wonderful time of study and fellowship for all of us. Um, it'll be a seven session study and the registration cost is $25 and that will cover the cost of the book. Registration ends Thursday, February 25th. That's this coming Thursday. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you sign up so you don't miss out on that great study. Um, it'll be March 4th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. And if you are wanting to register for interpreting services, you're gonna to want to do that by the 25th as well by emailing interpreting at bethanylaurel.org. As I mentioned, I'm the Director of Youth Ministry. We're still having our Wednesday night Zoom calls with the youth, so if you have a youth who wants to get involved or um, wants to check it out, email me at bccyouth at bethanylaurel.org. Love to hear from you. Or if you're interested in joining youth ministry uh, as a way to serve here at Bethany, um, email me. I would love to chat with you about that and see uh, how we can plug you in. We'd love to have you serving. If you're interested in knowing a little bit about what shenanigans we get into with youth ministry, check us out. I'm gonna click it, I think. Do it. Yes! Victoria! Wait, wait. Oh, yeah. Do it. Ready? Ready? (laughs) See? Shenanigans. Now it's the time in our service where we are worshiping through our tithes and offerings. Financially supporting Bethany is a great way to sow into the ministry that's happening right here in our community. So if you'd like to give, you can find out how through our website, bethanylaurel.org, or through our app. Please join me in prayer. Father God, I just thank you for this time that we can gather together, even virtually, Lord. Um, What a blessing it is to have technology to use for us to stay connected as a church and as a community. So God, I just pray over this community. I pray over this coming year, God, and ask for you to continue guiding us and leading us. God, I pray for those who are feeling disconnected. God, I ask that you will encourage them to reach out, Lord, so that we can join them where they're at, Bring them into this community, Lord. God, I thank you for the tithes and offerings that you're gonna use to bless this church and bless this community, God. We ask that you guide us as we are wise with those funds that you give. And we thank you for the blessings even in this challenging season. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us. your 
your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy of every song we could ever
can. Well, it's time for the word. Hey, join with me in Romans chapter 12. We'll be picking up in this Romans Revealed series. And today I want to take you into a sermon with a topic of be transformed. Be transformed. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being a gracious God. We thank you for being a just God. And we thank you for being a justifying God. We thank you that we are children of yours because of what you did through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. We thank you for the resurrection. And Lord, we thank you now for the words that, are, that we are able to learn delve into and apply to our lives through your word, the word of God. So now, Father, I pray now that even now that in different places across the nation and across the world, that our hearts might be ready to receive what you have for us, that we might be open and ready to not only hear the word, but that we might be doers of the word. So, Father, bless these your people and bless this time that we have. Remove any part of me that would prevent your word from being clear and going forth to your people. Stand in the gap. Have your way. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, so, picking up in Romans chapter 12. I know we've been in this series for a while. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to be concluding this series. Um, but what we found here is a treasure trove on a number of things that we have learned just in this one letter that Paul penned um, to this church in Rome. And in that, we've learned all about justification. We've learned about our own sanctification and indeed the salvation that Jesus gives us. We've learned where we stand and how God looks on at us and looks out on our behalf, how he fills us with his spirit and, and what that means for us. We've seen the benefits of it and the fact that we're loved um, by him and that because of that love, we have all inclusive rights to the kingdom of God through him. But today I want to take us to some of the other things that come with that love. And it's the outcome of what happens when we truly accept Jesus Christ and when we truly decide that we're going to be disciples. There is an outcome to that expressed love that works in us and through us for others to hear, see, and even emulate, if that's the right word here, um, where they have been taught by us in order that they might understand the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But then they also see in action our living testimony, our living demonstration. And that's what I want to deal with today is that, that living embodiment of what happens when we come to the full knowledge, but also the full submission to the word of God. So I want to start there by taking us into this chapter in Romans 12, where Paul has just come through. Um, you know, last week we talked about being loved in chapter eight. And between there and here, we saw this um, stream of thought that Paul speaks as he tries to inform this Jewish and Gentile community of who they are as one body in Christ. It's there where he breaks down and talks to the issues of how the, the Jewish community, that Jesus' own people, how their mistake therefore resulted in what we see as the opportunity for Gentiles to be what the Bible says is grafted in. You see, in an architectural world, there are certain, not architectural, I mean agricultural world, there are things that um, certain plants to grow them, you can graft them on and they'll become a part of the original um, crop, per se, and be an extension of it and they will become an actual bonded connection to it. And that's what the Gentiles experienced in that we were grafted into the family of God. And Paul explains this in detail um, between chapters 9 and chapter 11. And then coming off of that, he, he um, talks into the mystery of salvation, which we've spoken through a little bit um, 
in the previous um, messages about this, but then we get to chapter 12. And it's here in chapter 12 that I want to pick up in verse 1. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith of God that God has assigned. For as in one body we have, been, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine and abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless those, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so as far as it depends on you, live peacefully with all. I want to stop right there and I want to point us into this text um, with the message, Be Transformed. You see, there's several transformations that take place in the life of a believer. In the previous um, chapters, we saw that when we came to the knowledge and the faith in Jesus Christ, because of his death, burial, and resurrection, we were transformed from enemies of God to friends of God. And then we go from friends of God to children and heirs of God because we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And in that, we see transformation taking place from our stature as it relates to our God and our Father. But on the back end of that, there is that's what was done for us. And then there's now in verse, I'm sorry, in chapter 12, where there is an appeal being made by Paul that talks about a transformation that we ourselves have a role in. And in that transformation, there are several different ways that we are to be transformed. And those are the three ways things I want to focus in on this chapter, even though there's so much that we could do here, I want to focus in on those three areas. And I'll give them to you right up front and then I'll work my way through them. And that's one that we um, ought to have transformed minds. That we're to have transformed hearts. And then we should have transformed behaviors. Transformed minds transformed hearts, and then transformed behaviors. So, we're, so let's look at this first section of this scripture. In verses 1 through 8, we see Paul dealing with this, this community, and he deals with a number of things. He starts off with a, with a hard pill that is a blessed statement. In chapter 12, verse 1, he starts off and says, I appeal to you, Therefore, on account of all that I have told you to this point, on account that you Gentiles have been grafted in, on account that you Jews, yeah, there was a mistake, but you're still um, able to come back. And yes, um, we all are children of God because we have chosen to believe in Jesus Christ. And yes, the mystery of salvation is something that was given on our behalf. We were um, given something that 
um, is irrevocable in what Christ did for us. Now, even as Christ was a living sacrifice for our salvation, here he see, we see Paul make the appeal that in verse 1, that by the mercies of God, that we present, and I make it personal, we present our bodies as living sacrifice, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And then he categorizes it and says, this is your spiritual worship. When he says that, he then goes into a litany of other things. And here is where I want to pull us in so that we understand that even though Christ died for us, there's a part of the process that we are involved in. And I call us and invite us all into that process. And the first part of that process is that we have transformed minds. In chapter, in verse two, it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. I want to speak a little into this because I want us to understand what Paul says so that we know what to do with it. You see, when Paul says that we are not to be conformed, what he's saying is don't become behaviorally or socially similar to this world. He's saying don't become so similar to the world that you look more like it than the community of believers or, or like the heirs of the kingdom that you are. That's what that word means that Paul used for confirm. Conform there. It means to not become behaviorally or socially similar. Don't go out and do the same things that others are doing that God has called you not to do. Don't go on behaving ways just because someone else does it, but God has called you out of it. So no, you don't go back into it. This is a repeating of what he said in chapter six, that those of us who have died in sin are not um, to go on living in it that grace may abound. In fact, here he's saying you got to change your mind about some things in order to not be conformed into the ways of the world because if you don't change your mind, your behaviors won't change. He makes it pretty clear here. Paul, Paul tells us that we, um, we, we don't need to conform to what they're doing, but we have to be transformed and it's funny because you know I grew up in a generation and, and at this point a lot of the people around have grown up in these generations because we just keep coming out with the same movies over and over again but I remember even as a kid Transformers were out and I remember as a teen Transformers were coming back and then, then they had the newer Transformers movies and for those who aren't familiar Transformers are this um this being of sort from another planet and you had different types of them. You had the Autobots and then the, the other ones that are um, the bad guys in the scene and what they would do, they came to Earth but they would scan things and they could transform themselves to look like those things in order to conceal what they really were. So you had this guy named Optimus Prime. He was the leader of his group and they were they couldn't save their home, but they were able to kind of defend the earth. But in order to exist in a society, they would um, conform or transform their image to look like things around them so that people could not distinguish them from the other things. Now, that sounds great in the movies, but the reality is that some of us function like the Transformers, but not in the way that Paul means. We have learned to make ourselves look so much like everything around us that the world can't distinguish the difference between us and the things that we have been become. Um, we begin to emulate. So we look just like the world. We look just like that Mustang, even though the reality is that um, Bumblebee, the character inside of the Transformers movies, is so much more than the thing that he's emulating. And Paul says, don't be conformed to the ways of the world. Don't, don't make yourself look socially or behaviorally like the things of the world. Instead, transform in such a way that we can distinguish who you are. Now, how does that play into the illustration? You see, not only could the Transformers scan things around them and then transform themselves to look like the things around them. In other words, conforming to the world that was around them. 
But when necessary, they would transform back into what, what they really were. And when they were in their actual state, in all of their greatness, they could do so much and so many things that they couldn't do while they were in the image of something else. And see, for us as believers, in order for us to do and be and live out what God has called us to be and live out, we cannot be conformed socially or behaviorally so much so that the world can't see the distinction. Because if they can't see the distinction, then how will they ever see Christ? But instead, the word says here, it says that we ought to be transformed and that is to become changed in outward appearance or expression as manifesting a change in nature or essence. What Paul is saying with that definition is don't be socially or behaviorally reflective of the world. Instead, change your external behaviors to reflect what has already happened internally. Let me give you that definition again. It says to be or become changed in outward appearance or expression as manifesting a change in nature or essence. What that's saying is let what's going on on the outside of you reflect the change that's already happened on the inside of you. So Jesus was not living on the inside of you. The spirit of God had not yet filled you and you then submit your life to Christ, therefore being filled by the Holy Spirit, as Paul said, and therefore being children and heirs of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, then therefore let what has happened on the inside of you be reflected on the outside of you. And therefore you have to, to do that. You have to transform your mind. And this is what Paul states. He, he says it right behind us. He says, but be transformed by the, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. As your mind is transformed, so will your behaviors be conformed. So if you, just, if your mind changes and decides that I'm going to follow what the word of God says, and then your heart changes to accept it and the gift that comes with Jesus Christ, and then you start to live that out, then you will become what God has called you to be. And then there's an outcome of that. This is when, when you've been renewed, when your mind is renewed and therefore you've been transformed and therefore not conformed. It says that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Now, this is an interesting thing because it's here with this. The word play that Paul does here is, is loaded and packed. So stick with me for a second because here, when he says by testing, what he says is that we might be the by testing, may discern is all one word. It's, it's, it's broken up in English to give us all of those words to convey one sentiment. And that is that we might be able to judge what is right and commendable. And what he's saying is, is that when your mind is renewed, when you stop thinking like you used to think and you stop um, having an opinion that was based on how you used to live. Yeah, you came to God thinking that things were one way, but his word showed you something else. And when you conform or transform the way you think based on the word of God, then what ends up happening is you begin to see things through the lens of God. You see, I wear glasses and when I'm wearing, when I take my glasses off, there are some things that I can see still see and understand. However, when I put my glasses on, I can see things more clearly. Things that seemed okay before all of a sudden don't seem so okay because now I can see clearly the way I'm meant to see. And here is what we have is that when you have renewed your mind, you're able to see things in a way that allows you to see what is right in God's eyes and not your own. What is right in God's eyes and not what someone else told you and in that there are three things that come at the end of this renewal of your mind and is that you will be able to um discern judge what is the will of god what is good acceptable and perfect and, and when i first saw those i thought to myself well what's the big difference between what is good what is acceptable and what is perfect and in in my mind the first thing you start to think about what well, good is okay acceptable is well mm, you know, you, you got to see. Um, and then perfect is, yeah, this is the best that you can do. But that's not what Paul is saying. You see here, good, the word that he uses there actually conveys good morally. So you might know how to 
function morally is what he's saying here um in in our man in our humanity we'll be able to function from a moral place through looking at it through the lens of christ but then he also says what is acceptable and there that acceptable means well pleasing or giving pleasure and satisfaction perhaps in a greater degree than usual so not only are you the are you able to determine um, what is the will of God morally, but you're able to determine what is the will of God, what is well pleasing in his sight. You know what is um, something that he desires from you. And then the last thing is what is perfect. And that perfect means being complete of its kind and without defect or blemish. It means that when your mind is renewed, you will know how to live morally according to the word of God that you will be a you will know what to do that is pleasing in the sight of God and that you'll be complete you see all of this begins and is connected to the renewal of your mind and that's why we have to be transformed in our minds but then we jump over and the second thing is that we um are not only are our minds transformed but we are to have transformed hearts transformed hearts in verse 9 the bible says let love be genuine abhor what is evil hold fast to what is good love one another with brotherly affection outdo one another in showing honor do not be slothful in zeal be fervent in spirit serve the lord rejoice in hope be patient in tribulation be constant in prayer contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. It's interesting here because Paul uh, is laying out the marks of a Christian, the marks of one who really follows Jesus. So he started the chapter with a, a, a life that is sacrificial. He, he transitions a little bit and he talks about these gifts that we should use as we have them. And he comes away and says, here is what a believer looks like when their life has been transformed and when their heart has been transformed. And I want to just go through this list of things that Paul talks to because it challenges us to step beyond what our natural response might be to certain people, places, or things. It says, let love be genuine. And that word here really means unhypocritical, not pretended, it's sincerely felt or expressed. What he's saying is you don't fake like you love somebody. Genuinely build a love for them. Birth out a relationship with them. Whether they've done right or wrong by you. Learn to love people right where they are. Don't, don't smile in their face and then turn around and talk about them behind their back. Don't, don't smile when you're talking to someone who knows them. But when they walk away, you got this pain and this groaning inside of you because you have this animosity towards them. No, Paul says, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Disdain what is evil. Um, detest what is evil. We can submit all the words. But it's saying have a grossly um, adverse feeling toward the things that are evil things that function counter to the will of God things that don't align to the will of God abhor them don't just be somewhat okay with them don't just be well it's not me so it's not a bad it's not so bad I'm gonna mind my business he's saying there should be a passionate response internally that is opposed to the things that don't please God Hold fast to what is good. And it's interesting that Paul would immediately juxtapose those. He says, abhor the evil, but hold fast to what is good. Hold fast to those things that are morally upright. Hold fast to the things that please God. Take a hold of them and, and, and hold them tightly as the one who would not want to lose them. And that's what we have to be. We have to get to the point where we hold fast to God's word. Not that we hold it quickly, but that we hold on to it with such a grip that we don't want to let it go. And that we want to make sure that we're conforming our lives to it. Love with a brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. It, going beyond to do and exhort and encourage another to honor someone else. You know, one of the things that I do um, that I can speak to this on is that that my pastor, I have a pastor and and I seek to honor my pastor. When, when I have the opportunity to invest in his life, I do that. When I have the opportunity to encourage him, I do that. When If he had a preaching engagement and I was available to be there, I was there to support him. It was a way for me to show honor. 
I show honor to my wife. I, I open the door. I, I try to do things that make her feel honored at my own expense. And this is what that comes down to. It says, can you outdo one another? Can we have a competition that's not about me? Can we have a competition for how we can do more for the next person? Can I show you more honor? Can I give you more respect? Can I be more hospitable to you? Not what can I get out of this? What are you doing for me? But what can I do for you? Can I outdo you? Can I out give you? Um, not as a means of pride for myself, but as a means of showing you that what God has done for me and how that's reflected in how I intend to handle you. Fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. We, we should rejoice in hope, but also be patient in tribulation. One of the hardest things um, to teach people is that tribulation or long suffering is a part of the Christian experience. You see, it, don't, it won't always be the way we want it to be. That's that's not anywhere in Scripture. When we look throughout the New Testament and even in what we call the Old Testament, you'll constantly see that either by our own doing and sin or by nature of being opposed to the world, the, that we face tribulation. And we are to exhibit patience as we go through, knowing that what we're going through is not what we're going to Constant in prayer. When we have transformed hearts, this list of things that Paul points out, including the fact that we contribute to the needs of the saints. Now, when you get into the, the, the context and the culture here, that was they, that most of the churches in this time period were house churches. They didn't have the facilities like we have today because the, the larger government body and religious authorities were actually trying to stamp them out. So they had house churches and the way they contributed to each other was that they brought what they had to the church, which at the time was the house. And from the house, which was serving as their church, they were able to meet the needs of those who didn't have. So their generosity at their church house was how they were able to meet the needs of the community. And that's the same today. The resources that come into the church allow us to do things in the community, it allows us to do things for those who lack or to contribute to the needs of the saints. And then he ends with being hospitable. What does that mean for us? All of these come down to heart issues. See, how you think allows you to judge the situations you're in through the lens of, of the word of God to, to then conform how you function based on what you know. But these here are tied into how, what's going on on the inside of you, what's in your heart. Love is something that is a choice, but it's also birthed from inside of you. So I choose to love you and I choose to extend myself from what's going on inside of me. Um, when I abhor something or I detest it, it is a feeling inside of me. It's not just my thoughts um, all the time. It's as soon as it happens, I know I feel some type of way about it. And that same feeling is because in this case, the thing that used to please you yesterday no longer pleases you because now you've renewed your mind and you're a, you have a transformed heart. So the things that displease God now displease you. And that's why you can abhor what is evil. The reason that you are trying to outdo and I'll give to someone else is because it's going counter to what you've been. Because most of us pre-Christ had a selfishness about us where everything is about us. But when our hearts are changed, it sends a reverse course where we give more than we care to get. We serve more than we seek to be served. We rejoice in hope. Not that we got it, but we rejoice in the hope that is Jesus Christ. We rejoice for others. We mourn when others mourn because we empathize with them. Because our hearts now pour out for others in the same way that Jesus poured himself out for us. And when that's the case, our hearts get changed. And, and when our hearts change, we want to stay connected with our Father. And therefore, we stay constant in prayer. So our minds have to be transformed and, and then our hearts have to be transformed. And, and the two together lend to our behaviors being transformed. So we go from a transformed mind to a transformed heart to transformed behaviors. And I want to take you down to verses 14 through 19. And the Bible here says in verse 14 of chapter 12 of Romans, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice 
with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Paul begins this section or the, continues his thought as he transitions through some things and still talking about the marks of a believer. In verse 14, he says that we're to bless those who persecute us and bless and do not curse. And he says it and then he repeats it because our natural tendency, our behavior is if someone does us wrong, it causes us to feel a certain way and think a certain way. And therefore we respond a certain way. But Paul has already told you that your mind has to now be transformed and renewed. Your heart has to be transformed and and God takes your hard heart of stone and makes it soft so that you can feel and when those two take place then when you go and people persecute you or they rise against you or they talk about you then your response your behavior is different than it otherwise would have been so when people um, lie on you you don't seek to lie back on them when people um, talk about you you don't Go out and talk about them. And here, when people persecute you, not only do you not persecute them or not curse them, but instead you do the opposite. Paul says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them, which infers that some of us in some of them have a natural cursing spirit on us. And what happens is when someone does something we don't like, we're about ready to cuss them out. Oh, oh. Uh, I can say it because I know y'all are feeling it. When people cross you, you got a you got something that rises up inside of you and you give a response. And what Paul is saying, when things come against you and when things persecute you and seek to undermine you and put you down, and when things come from ways and avenues and arenas that you didn't see them coming and they don't feel good, don't curse the people who did it to you. Instead, bless them. Oh, that's a tough one. I got to give you a minute to swallow that one because it's a hard one that can only be done when our minds have been transformed and our hearts have been transformed. Only then can we get to a place where when someone does us wrong or someone does us dirty, that instead of cursing them out or cursing them or doing anything that might lend them to harm, I'm not running to the boss to snitch on them. I'm not running to my friends to talk about them. I'm not running to other people at church to start a gossip ring about them. No, I'm going to bless them and I'm going to pray for them and I'm going to deposit in them so that the things that, that they do might then be changed by way of how I treated them. He says rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. What he's saying is take a moment to think about someone else and respond. So when someone else is rejoicing because they got a job, don't hate on them because they got a job. Celebrate their promotion. Celebrate what they're doing and, and rejoice just like they were rejoicing. Rejoice like it was you. When someone else's child gets a scholarship, rejoice like it's your child. When someone else gets married and you might have wanted to be married or you're waiting to be married, rejoice like it's you getting married. When someone else gets a house and maybe you wanted a house, rejoice like it's your house. And that's what he's saying. Rejoice when they rejoice. But also, weep with those who weep. So when someone else is going through, don't ignore their calamity simply because you are okay. When someone else is hurting, don't, don't say it's not my problem. Take time to be with them. Go up with them when they go up. Get down on your knees with them when they are down on their knees and pray and, re and weep with them because it's, you're sacrificing your time to be where they are that they might be edified. And when you transform your mind and your heart, your behaviors become less about you. Live in harmony. Live in community peacefully. Can you connect with others without causing strife? It's not always about being right or wrong. How do we function? This is behavioral pattern. And then the way to know if you're functioning is when you walk in the room, are people pleased that you're there? Or is there some anxiety that elevates because you've entered the space? And if it's anxiety, then it's time to transform your behaviors so that when people see you coming, there's an excitement to your presence because in your presence, they know if they rejoice, you'll rejoice. And in your presence, if they're down, you'll get down and be right there with them until they you build them back up. 
That's what a transformed behavior looks like. Transformed behavior leads us to be humble. See, the Bible says, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Be humble. Humility. Be willing to go with the low. If people are down, don't. when you see somebody who comes into the church and maybe they smell like alcohol or maybe they come in and their clothes are tattered, um, don't look at them and think that you're better off. Instead, embrace them just like you would embrace someone who came in with a three-piece suit. Embrace them just like you would embrace the person next to you because you never know what they're going through and you never know what God's going to do through you on their behalf. Instead, the Bible says, don't be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Don't be wise in your own eyes. You might know some things, but you don't know everything. None of us knows everything, but what we do know is that the word of God has an answer for anything. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. That means when people do you wrong or they set out to do evil, make sure that your response can be found worthy when others see it. So while they talked about you, don't let it be said of you that you were talking about them. When, when they did you wrong, don't let it be said that you were scheming to do them harm. Instead, make sure that your actions are honorable. Make sure that when people look at the circumstances of the events as they play out, that they know that someone did you wrong, but they can commend you on your behaviors because transformed behaviors go beyond what your natural response might be. And then Paul ends, he, um, what I want to end here with this is that if possible, that means as long as it's up to you, as long as it's in your hands and as long as it's in your care, don't sit on a grudge. Don't sit around being um, um, mad and angry and bitter and don't go get your posse to be mad and anger, angry and bitter with you. But if it's possible, so far as it depends on you, as long as you are the one in control. Now, if the person doesn't want to deal with you and it's not because of something you're doing but they've just decided that they're not going to do it that's not something you can control but as long as it's within your control and as long as it's um, on your hands or within your hands you live peaceably with all live at peace with all Paul is making clear to this community that as they come together they got to change the way they think they got to change the, the way their hearts are or, or allow God to change their hearts. And then how they behave has to be distinct and distinguished from how the world might naturally expect them to behave. And, and that biblical truth is the same biblical truth that works today. Even though Paul was talking to them, it's true for us. That there are some mindsets and behavioral practices that we walk into God's house with the first time that God says, yeah, it's okay that you came in and your mind was that. And the, the fact that you're here, my word will now help to change your mind. And when you see the world through my word, you see things as you've never seen them before. You see that justice and mercy are important. You see that caring for those who are the least of these is important. You see that it's not all about you. You see that it's better to give than to receive. And when you've gotten that, God can take your heart and he can mold your heart like clay and take what was a stone and make it like flesh where it feels and it beats for others so that your heart may feel for things the way God feels for them. That you'll feel the opposition to the things that will draw you away from him, but you'll feel an attraction to the things that please him. And in doing so, because you're in his word and your um, your mind has changed and your heart has changed, that your behaviors will reflect the word. That you will handle yourself with others the way the Bible tells us to. And in doing so, you will reflect externally the nature and essence of Christ that is now dwelling within you. So that the world might see you and through you see him. And that's why it's important that we understand and that we um, submit ourselves to the word of God so that we might be transformed.
And I don't know where you are. I don't know where you are in your walk. Maybe you're saying, you know what? My mind is getting right, but my heart is still heavy. And, and maybe my, my, my heart is open, but my mind is still in work in progress. Or maybe my, my mind and my heart are good, but my actions are lacking. Wherever that is, I'm going to pray with you. But maybe you're here and you're saying, I know my mind is messed up, but it's messed up because I never gave my heart to Christ. I've never made a decision to follow him. I've never confessed that he is Lord. I've never acknowledged that he, he died for my sins, that he rose from the grave for me. I've never confessed with all these, Lord, or believed in my heart that God raised him from the dead, but I do today. I want to pray with you because that's what the Bible says. It says that, that you will be you are saved by that. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So if that's you, I want to pray with you. And you can hit, if you're on our church online, go ahead and hit that. I've decided to follow Jesus if today that's a decision you want to make. And maybe you're here and you're saying, I've, I've decided to follow Jesus, but I haven't been walking out all of this. And I want to commit to that. I want to pray for you as well. Heavenly Father, I thank you for every person viewing this cast. I thank you for those who um, are encouraged by this word that we have the ability to be transformed more and more. We can be spiritually formed more and more into your likeness. I also thank you for the person who feels a conviction to change from a pattern of behavior that didn't align with your word. Lord, I thank you that your word cuts both ways. Lord, I pray for the individuals who decided to follow you today. Lord, let them know that you love them and that you have your arms wide open, ready to hold them fast to you. And that all they have to do is confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart that you raised them from the dead and they will be saved. And in that they gain a savior who can save them from the penalty of sin. And they also gain a Lord who can guide their steps. Lord, I pray for the person who has said, I've decided to follow Jesus, but I'm struggling in my walk. Lord, I pray that they might know today that they can always return to you. And that while we're all flawed and we're all still spiritually being formed into your likeness and being transformed in all these ways, that when we miss it, you're always ready to wrap your arm back around us and forgive us and to restart us in that next moment. I pray for those seeking a connection with the community that might help them in this walk. Lord, I pray if it's Bethany that they might connect with us. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your son. And I thank you for every single person who's just made a decision for you, who has made a decision for you, or who will make a decision from this cast. In Jesus' name, amen. I am so grateful for each of you. And especially you who made a decision for Jesus. It is the best decision you can ever make. I hope I'll see you on Wednesday for Bible study. If not, until we meet again and until we greet again, I look forward to seeing you next week. So may the Spirit of God and sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with you. God bless you all.